Board meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education, Monday, January 14th, 2019 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Member Miller. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Siegel. Here. Member Purcell. Here. Uh, tonight, we'll start with the flag salute with Indian Trail School and Principal Brubach. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, I apologize for my coughing. I have bronchitis, so I apologize if I start hacking. Um, I'd first like to introduce our student council advisor, Mrs. Sandy Laff, and she's going to introduce our student council members. Hello. Good evening. Uh, Maya, we have Kimmy, we have Mia, we have Avery, and we have Connor, and they have a presentation put together for you today, so I'm going to let them go ahead and take over. Good evening. My name is Maya and I'm the Vice President of City Council. Um, something I'll be talking to you about is Red Ribbon Week. Um, Red Ribbon Week is a time that we dress up for certain themes to show that we're a drag free school. Um, one example of this is wearing sunglasses to blackout drugs. Um, we like to add some phrases in like that. Um, spirit days are a bit different though. Um, on spirit days, we dress up in things as well to show school spirit. Some examples of these are Pajama Day and Sunday Day. Hello, my name is Avery. I'm Secretary of Student Council. Today I will be talking about Knitted Winter. Knitted Winter is a collection of knitted items such as socks, scarves, mittens, hats, and more. Once we have collected the items from each classroom at the end of the collection, we donated the clothing to Good News. It was a great success. We donated many items. Hi, my name is Kimmy and I'm the president of Student Council. I'm going to tell you about a fundraiser we had for cancer awareness. Over the summer, we were sad to find out that these staff members were diagnosed with breast cancer. To show our support for their struggles, we, deci we decided to have a fundraiser to donate money to breast cancer research facilities. We decided to sell snow cones at the back to school kickoff. It was a huge success and we made $427. Hi, I'm Connor, the treasurer of Student Council. We have lots of fundraisers like selling candy canes and school supplies to make money. Some of the school store items we sell are pencils, which are smelly pencils, <laughs> pencil sharpeners, pencil grips, and other cool things. We have school store every other Wednesday. The week before winter break, we decided to sell candy canes. That was a big success, and we made $398 that we donated to the American Cancer Society. This year we also had a box top collection. We asked the kids in our school to bring in as many box tops as they could, and the class with the most to collect it would win a prize. The winning class was one of the fourth grade classes. We collected about 6,000 box tops, which would be about $600 towards our school. The money went towards school activities. Hello, my name, my name is Mia, and I'm a social member of Student Council. Communion Day was the most exciting day for the school year. With the help of Ms. Luck, we find volunteers to teach many sections that are in our community. For example, we have, ha we have had wrestling, coloring, dance art, cookie decorating, making slime, kickball, soccer, basketball, section of flagging room. This picture was taken during our drum session. Sorry, this picture. <laughs> during our drum session. <laughs> Thank you for your time and focus on your presentation. Thank you very much, and we have some gifts for the student council. Yes. <laughs> How exciting is that? Two of our members 
are in um, extend programs. So that blocks out our Mondays and our Wednesdays. So we were kind of really close when we came back from break. So thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. This is Drew Bach. You did a great job. Good job. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. They are pretty impressive without microphones, I gotta say. Yeah. <laughs> nice job, you guys. I'm really proud of you. Um, I'd like to introduce Amy Vogt from our PTA, and she's gonna talk about one of our PTA fundraisers. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to talk real quickly about the pie sale we had. That was kind of a big um, highlight of our year. We sold over 460 pies. I did not buy any of them uh, for me, but I did donate. We had a donation uh, option, which was great for my waistline. Um, and we actually donated 60 pies to the West Suburban Food Pantry. So right in time for Thanksgiving, which was, I think, a great idea. Um, ended up with a profit of $2,300 for our PTA. So a big fundraiser for the year, a lot of fun. And like I said, the option of donating Girl Scout cookies, pies is always a good thing. Um, a lot of people enjoy that. So thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so as I was trying to think about what to present tonight, um, I just kept going back to Seesaw because Seesaw has just an opportunity to show everything that's going on in our school. It also has an opportunity to show um, how parents are more involved just because of Seesaw. So that's what my presentation was. It shows some of the things that are going on in Indian Trail as well. Um, we've used Seesaw since 2016. And some of the things that we get from Seesaw are some of these charts and graphics and things. But um, I think it's really interesting just to see the amount of contact that we have with parents on a regular basis. So this is weekly parent engagement since this, um, September of 2016. Um, so it is our third school year using it. Um, and you can see that those parent contacts and those parent visits have increased over the years, which has been really nice. I mean, the old days we used to send newsletters. Um, and as a teacher, I know that most of my newsletters went in the recycle bin um, or in the garbage before recycling was very popular. So I think this is just a really good way that you know we've been able to contact parents and parents can see things um, as they're happening and being recorded at school. Um, this is another piece of likes from parents. One of the things we talked about with parents this year in some of our classrooms was giving feedback that was a little bit more than just the heart. I think that we've gotten so used to social media and hearting everything um, that we've been talking a little bit about having parents contact their feedback, I'm sorry, um, being a little bit more substantial. So I'll show you a little bit of um, our growth in that area as well. Um, those huge dips are vacation times and people don't go on. So it's not like all of a sudden any trail falls off the planet. Um, Again, here's some more parent visits. Um, this goes back to 2016, um, and you can just see the amount of increases as it goes through. Um, some of the other analytics that you can get through Seesaw, you can see that little um, square at the, or rectangle at the top. Um, it says 10, 24, 2018. Um, you can see how many parents visited that day. So on that day alone, there were 975 visits by parents, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, again, that contact back and forth and the, the triangle between parents, teachers, and, and students is really a powerful thing. So at Indian Trail, we've been using um, Seesaw for two major things. One is student-directed portfolios, where students have choices of what they post, and then also teacher assessment support. Um, so students post book reviews, their writing pieces, some of the things they do in SEL lessons, pictures, videos. Um, some students will post things from home um, of their personal accomplishments, too, um, which is really nice for teachers to see. It kind of brings them into their, their homes as much as we're trying to bring parents into our schools. Um, in terms of teacher assessment, there's been some really good tools with um, Seesaw for Schools. Um, teachers are able to s assess math procedures form formatively, comprehension, isolated skills. They do a lot of phonics work in um, kindergarten, first and second grade in terms of um, phonics skills and sorting words. Um, students have reflections, which I'll show you one of those as well. Um, and sometimes they can even do a pretest so they can see where students are with the concept. So some of the things that student posts, this is a first grade STEM activity that they did one afternoon. So the student, I'm not going to play the video for you, um, went through and, and showed their picture and then they voice recorded over it of what they did in order to come up with it. So they talked about all the STEM situations, what their um, activity was, um, what the challenge was, and how they were supposed to get through that. So.
Um, here's another picture that one of the students posted. Um, students have buddies in the building, so this is one of the buddy activities. Um, pick this one because do not photo wasn't an issue, she says. Um, here's a third grade posting. The student decided to post they did an activity or as the student says a 2019 thing um, that we have to answer questions about your goals for the year. Um, and so they posted those. Um, so that was nice for parents to see. It's a good conversation starter for parents at home. And then fifth graders post the books that they're doing for their 40 book challenge. Uh, teacher formative assessments. Um, this is one from Christy Hopkins class. Um, what she does is she um, has instructions that she records. So when the students hit that play instruction button, they get the instructions from the teacher. They can play it over and over again as much as they need to. And then they have to um, do an activity on Seesaw. Um, and the students really like that. Um, teachers also can see, so this is a teacher setting part, how many students responded. So there were 20 responses um, and three not responded. Um, it could be that those three students didn't do it because they didn't want to, or it could be that those three students didn't do it because they weren't assigned to do it. So teachers can sign to various children as well. Um, so that was nice. You can see the date, January 10th, um, <coughs> and the skill. So um, Mrs. Hopkins then has a skill that's um, connected with this. She can assess it and keep all of that data within Seesaw. Uh, first grade teachers, formative assessment, they do a lot of word work um, and a lot of phonics. Again, you can see um, all the <coughs> oh, that would be great. Thank you. You can see all of the um, data that she has there as well. I'm almost done. Um, fourth grade teacher, she did this um, in September to see what students knew um, about standard form and writing and expanded form. So that's really helpful as well. Um, this is just a reflection that was done last week. Students in sixth grade went to the Holocaust Museum. And so this is one of our students who responded. Um, teachers were able to give the students an activity to do, and then they would go, be able to go through them at their, their pace. Um, but parents also were able to see that and see what their students did that day. Um, I think, too, as the students see their writing over time, um, it's really helpful for them to see the growth that they've made. Um, in terms of teacher and parent feedback, it's been a really good opportunity for teachers to um, communicate with their students. So this is Taylor Holmes, our second grade teacher. Um, it says, double check that you followed all the directions from the close read, please. So she's able to go back and have children go back and review their work without having necessarily to meet with every single student during the school day. So she does those after school, and then the students can go back and look at those later. Um, Christina Forsley is our LRC teacher, um, and this is a student who had posted something. I left the post out, but she was able to communicate with him something he did in LRC. So he was with her for the 45 minutes, um, and then she was able to look at it later and, and read back. And then that's his mom commenting back. That's awesome, Jackson. Great job. Um, so Jackson got to comment, the teacher, the specialist got to comment, and so did his mom. Um, here's another one. Um, so this student showed a video of him playing guitar at home. Um, and so he sent it to his teacher. Um, his teacher, Ashley Austin, in fourth grade commented. And then both of the parents got to comment as well. Again, it's bringing community together when we don't necessarily have time for those face-to-face. -face, um, but it, it keeps us all connected in a really um, fun um, and learning way. So here are some of the benefits that Indians Trails has seen through Seesaw. Obvious increased communication with parents um, about what's happening during the school day. It's about learning. It's not about the test. It's not about the field trip. It's about what we're really doing in school. Um, increased student ownership of learning. If you walk down Indian Trails halls ever, you'll see little kids sitting in their cubbies talking to their iPads. Um, and they're posting on Seesaw. Um, they get to choose when they do that. Um, they tell their teacher, I'm going to go out in the hall and record. Um, some of the recordings are really funny because you can hear sometimes me walking down the hall talking to somebody in their recordings. But um, they love to do that and share all the things that they're doing. Um, increased dialogue between teacher, student, and parents, formative assessment, and obviously growth portfolio for multiple years. At the end of the year, t parents are able to download all of their student stuff so that they can keep a digital portfolio as well. So um, Seesaw has great benefits, and I think it's a great way just to show kind of the things that are going on at Indian Trail. Thank you. Thank you for that update. You're welcome. Anyone have any questions? Sorry, throwing under the bus for questions. Anyone? <laughs> no? Okay, thank you.
So tonight we are trying out the video recording of our board meeting this evening. Uh, the entire meeting tonight is being recorded and, we will, and will be posted to the district website later this week. Uh, as a reminder, members of the audience will have the opportunity to provide a public comment to the board during the reception of visitors later on the agenda. The board asks that anyone wishing to comment Please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket by Megan Hewitt on the table to my right. Uh, they will be used to assist us in allocating time so that all of those who wish to speak will have the opportunity and help us follow up after the meeting. Recently, the board completed its self-evaluation with the IASB, which is the Illinois Association of School Boards. Uh, we will be discussing this later in the agenda under the discussion topic. However, as part of that review, the board has agreed to take a closer look at opportunities for the community for community engagement efforts of the, with the board, especially related to regular board meetings and public comment during the reception of visitors. In order to facilitate more additional opportunities for open dialogue between board members and members of our community, we have included extended reception of visitors within our workshop meetings. As a board, we would also like to schedule a quarterly meet and greet opportunity with the community in conjunction with regular board meetings of the Board of Ed to provide increased opportunity for open dialogue. We hope this will provide increased opportunity for open dialogue since the public comment reception of visitors portion of the regular business meetings does not allow for a back and forth dialogue. Tonight, the board plans to allocate 30 minutes to public comment reception of visitors. Please fill out the card if you wish to speak. The board will ask each person who intends to speak uh, to plan to speak for no more than three minutes in order to allow the opportunity for all to present. We will invite those who have submitted the cards to speak first. If time allows, others will have the opportunity to address the board as well. Uh, so next, we will go to recognition of students, uh, middle school, fall, and winter athletes. The winter seasons at our middle schools concluded just prior to winter break, with many athletic successes realized at both of our middle schools. The board would like to thank our coaches who support these teams and congratulate our students for their hard work, good sportsmanship, and accomplishments throughout their respective seasons. Listed on tonight's agenda are the names of the athletes and coaches being recognized this evening. Uh, next, the board would like to recognize and thank the Downers Grove Junior Women's Club for their generous support, support of and donations to the Downers Grove Grade School District. Among their many contributions to our community, the Junior Women's Club has recently partnered with District 58 and a local nonprofit, uh, Mav Mavins, to bring buddy benches to Downers Grove Elementary School playgrounds. In addition, they are partnering with District 58 to help raise funds to provide additional social emotional curriculum resources for K through five teachers. Representatives from the Women June, Downers Grove Junior Women's Club, Samantha and Aaron are here with us this evening. Uh, Samantha and Aaron, thank you for your contribution to our schools and our community. And if you'd like to speak, please come up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aaron Kolshowski. Thank you for recognizing the Downers Grove Junior Women's Club this evening. I'm this year's president of the Downers Grove Junior Women's Club, and I'm also a mom. My son is in fifth grade at Whittier Elementary School. This is Sam Samantha Figueroa. She's our co-chair of our Ways and Means um, Committee. She does the fundraising that enables us to do projects like this. Uh, um, so the Downers Grove Junior Women's Club is a non Profit organization. Um, we're a group of volunteer local women that basically try to support the community and give back to the community wherever we see a need. Um, and we like to have a little bit of fun while we're doing it. Um, we do things through volunteer service. We promote other charitable organizations and we also make financial contributions. We serve both Downers Grove and the greater DuPage County. And we are so pleased to be a longtime community partner of the Downers Grove District 58. Um, in fact, Sam and I uh, put together this uh, bullet point for the board, and we were amazed by all the projects we actually do working together um, to, to support our schools. Um, I'll, I'll touch on a few of them since the crowd doesn't have all these bullet points. 
Um, this past year, we donated over $30,000 to our local community, um, not just to our schools, but to a wide variety, senior citizens, homeless shelters, um, pretty much even some um, animal shelters, anywhere we saw a need in the local community. And it's membership driven. It's where our members see a need in the community as well. Um, some of our highlights, we did recently give a $10,000 grant to Sharing Connections to provide cribs for local, local families. Um, to highlight on some of the things we've done this past year for District 58, um, we made donations to the District 58 reading games. In fact, this year we went from $150 last year, we're now supporting them with $500. Um, our members are very pleased to be doing that. We have the upcoming Junior High Art Awards. We like to celebrate our, our young artists and that are in seventh and eighth grade. Uh, their art awards, um, we'll be awarding them at our February meeting, and then our art, their art will be dis on display at the Community Bank of Downers Grove after that. Um, Next week, we have our upcoming Mother-Son Gym Jam. It's not just for mothers. It can be representatives um, as well. And we do this with the Park District. It's a fun evening, and the proceeds from that go for scholarships for District 99 senior students. <clears throat> Last year, we were able to award three $2,500 college scholarships to local ni District 99 students. So please come out and help us support that next week. Um, in addition, we started a teacher grant award last year. It was our, our first time um, with, with the Green Apple Awards. We decided our teacher appreciation awards weren't what they used to be. Um, it was initially we were going to do $500 for um, uh, innovative programs or community, excuse me, continuing education for a teacher to bring back to support their local students as well as students throughout the district. We were so impressed. Um, with all the applications that we ended up giving out for $500 grant, um, grants to teachers in the district. And uh, we also gave a $500 donation last year to Mavens, which is Mothers Against Violence in Schools. They chose to do a bathroom renovation project um, at Whittier School, and they beautified the bathroom. They had inspirational quotes and made it um, a more I guess they promoted kindness and confidence in the students, and we were surprised by the overwhelming positive re response we got from the community. They have that project available to, for other schools to use as a cookbook and um, show them how we did it at Whittier. Um, and finally, we do a lot of working with the principals in each of the schools and the social workers each year where we provide or identify families in need. We provide Thanksgiving meals for them. We provide holiday gifts for them, um, as well as oftentimes just bare essentials. We uh, sped up our process this year. We usually wait for the holidays, and we ended up buying boots and mittens and gloves for a family early because they didn't have anything for the first snow. Um, and finally, I just want, and we, with that, we like to spread it around throughout the schools in the district, um, try to be equitable with that. Um, I'm going to end with, I just wanted to share a note we just got from one of the, uh, the social workers at Indian Trail School. Thank you so much for sponsoring one of our families for Christmas. The family's gratitude was overwhelming. These sweet little girls who had come to school with socks on their hands as mittens now have beautiful new gear in addition to special gifts. Thank you for being angels for them. This is why we do what we do. I'm going to hand this over to Sam. Thank you, Erin. Um, but there's more. So 2019 marks the Downers Grove Junior Women's Club's 60th anniversary and commitment to the community. And to celebrate, what we wanted to do was to accept a challenge, our biggest challenge yet in, in the club's history. So last summer, we had the opportunity to connect with Dr. Crimscoli and um, present the challenge, what can we do for the district? Um, and we identified uh, in the social and emotional learning and the social well-being of our students some opportunities um, and initiatives in which we can help out. So keeping in mind district equity, we wanted to make sure that we're providing initiatives that um, provide balance uh, and equitable resources for all schools. Um, the Buddy Bench program, some of you in the audience might be familiar with the Buddy Benches. It's not just a bench, it's a program. The Mothers Against Violence in School 
schools, they promote this program which helps students understand what a buddy bench is. And the premise of it, if you're unfamiliar, is that the, bunch, the benches are there at elementary school playgrounds. If a student is lonely or needs a friend, they can sit on the bench and the students are trained or cued to know that that individual that's sitting on the bench is looking for a friend. So uh, trying to start at the most fundamental levels of social and emotional learning, anti-bullying, how can, inclusion, how can we um, help promote that? Well, there are some of the schools in District 58 that have the Buddy Bench program by Mavens, and there are some that don't. So what we decided to do is one of our initiatives is to help fund um, the Buddy Bench program for the rest of the uh, Downers Grove District 58 elementary schools. So I'm proud to announce that we um, are donating 11 buddy bunches to the following schools, Bel Air, El Sierra, Fairmount, Highland, Indian Trail, and Pierce Downer. But there's more. So we wanted to try and figure out what, what else we could do uh, to help promote social emotional learning. And talking with Dr. Krimascoli, um, there were some, uh, some maybe wants, um, wishes, that the teachers, teacher resources that they could use. Um, and Dr. Krimascoli, please feel free to maybe uh, follow up Jeremy. with this if you'd like. Um, but what we wanted to do was to be able to provide more curriculum resources for um, the uh, social and emotional learning uh, for the teachers. So right now, as I understand, the current, the current scenario is that some of the teachers have to share curriculum resources. And what we want to try and do is to um, provide more resources that each teacher would be able to have their own curriculum set. So um, we are all in the wrong business and should be in curriculum selling because <laughs> to provide 13 additional SEL curriculum sets, our goal is to try and um, contribute to that large expense, about $33,000, almost $34,000. So in total, what we're um, hoping to do is, as I mentioned, one of the biggest challenges, uh, fundraising challenges that we've had to date, um, all uh, with the social and emotional well-being of our students and teachers in mind. Um, but more importantly, we are very humbled and grateful uh, to have so many opportunities to support the district, um, the students and the educators. Uh, we know that it takes a village more than anyone, and we warmly invite the community to join us in our upcoming Downers Grove Junior Women's Club events because if you support our events, that allows us to support the community um, and especially our students. So I've got one special quote. I know that Aaron had one too, but um, we received one of these, uh, uh, a thank you note, which kind of makes the good reasons why you're all doing these things that you do. Um, we had adopted a family at, uh, at the holidays, during the holidays, and she had said, thank you to everybody for helping my children uh, have a holiday. This is a, a District 58 family. Without you, I don't think that I could have had a Christmas for my children this year. Thank you once again to the Downers Grove Junior Women's Club for your kind and caring concerns for my family. I am not used to anyone lending a helping hand in this manner, and my great, uh, gratitude is beyond words. So thank you very much to the district. We look forward to many more years, 60 more years of giving to you and supporting. Um, and if anybody has any questions, you could also go to our website, Downers Grove, uh, the Downers Grove Junior Women's Club uh, website, or find us on Facebook. It's uh, www.dgjwc.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, so now, uh, Mr. Sisso gets to follow that. Uh, spotlight on our schools and the STEM committee update. Thank you very much. I don't know that we'll have the same warm feeling that the, that the <laughs> Junior Women's Club elicited, but we'll, we'll do our best. <laughs> Uh, we're happy to be here tonight to talk about the, the journey of the STEM committee over the past several years and where we are now and where we hope to be in the coming weeks. So this evening we will briefly review NGSS and the history of the STEM committee. Some of this will be information that our board and our community has heard before, but we felt it, it 
made sense to put it all in one place this evening. We'll talk about the, the pilot process that's been ongoing this school year. And then, as I said, we'll talk a little bit about where we hope to be heading in the next uh, several weeks. I'm happy to have mem many members of the STEM committee with us here tonight, a few of whom are going to aid in the presentation, beginning with Kelly DeMarco, who's a fifth grade teacher at Pierce Towner. Good evening. I'm um, tasked with the first several slides that have to do with just the meat of NGSS, which we've all heard about over the years, but it's being recapped again here. So the Next Generation Science Standards is just a mandated new approach to science instruction. Um, this side, slide talks about the fact that it is a three-dimensional learning that incorporates science and engineering practices, cross-cutting concepts, and core ideas that encompass K through 12. Um, it is, you know, important that all three dimensions are infused into the learning in order to get that NGS, NGSS aligned instruction. Content within NGSS um, is separated a little bit. There's the K-5 grouping that is um, divided by topic, and then you have middle school and high school. Uh, middle school is grades six through eight, and the content is typically sequential, um, so not necessarily grade level specific. Here is an example of, you know, one of the um, part of the unit, I guess, the Earth systems. If you look at the top box, the grade box that goes um, all the way across, those are your performance expectations. So this would be a second grade Earth systems um, unit or part of that. Below you have the blue, the orange, and the green, and there is your three-dimensional learning and how they all support those performance expectations. Um, if you go here, then this would be a middle school example. So again, performance expectations, those things that the students should be able to do. And you've got the 3D experience underneath and um, how they support that. Oh, this one. <laughs> that wasn't, okay, it's gonna come sequentially there. Um, so here you're gonna get an example of some performance expectations. Now these are not related to Earth Systems, these are another unit. But at the very bottom, that, that point you can't see the, the grade band, it's K-12. And this just kind of shows you how they build upon each other, these performance expectations. So at the K-2 level, students would be you know, expected to demonstrate planning and conducting um, an investigation. And again, there might be other words that are used, but it scaffolds up then when you're in grades three through five, you should be able to go a little bit further, making observations and measurements to identify things. Again, just an example of a performance expectation. Um, in grades six through eight, you should be able to analyze and interpret possibly. And then going on into high school, um, using your knowledge to predict based on, you know, your previous experiences. So it does build upon itself within each content area. <clears throat> There's big shifts, and we've been hearing about them for years. Um, I love this slide because it, it lays it out. Um, NGSS is more student-centered. The students are doing, the students are thinking, the students are creating with guidance um, from the teacher. The teacher is no longer, um, you know, opening up a recipe book or a cookbook and saying, this is what we're gonna do today, these are the things we're gonna learn, this is what you should know at the end. It's um, much more open-ended, but yet it's guided. Um, but it really is about the students doing. Students are not expected to master right away. They need repeated exposure um, to concepts and the content in order to eventually master. Um, and that's why it just kind of spirals upon itself and continues to build. Thank you, Kelly. To talk a little bit about the history of the STEM committee is Megan Beard, who's a third grade teacher at Leicester. How do I do this? Big one in the middle. Okay, hello. <laughs> um, all right. So NGSS was formally adopted by um, the Illinois State Board of Education in 2014 with a target goal um, of 2016-17 for us to get started. Our STEM committee started in October of 2013, which seems so long ago. <laughs> 
Um, just some early work. So um, we were learning the standards, um, kind of knowing what our instructional shifts in practice would be, researching resources. Um, we weren't quite finding any that were NGSS aligned. Um, therefore, we were joining multi-district um, science collaborative, kind of getting together outside of 58 as well. I guess I could just click it with this. Um, so we have on our committee, we have elementary and middle school um, members, and we needed to kind of double. We, um, we wanted people who weren't just teaching science in some of the elementary schools. They split their time. Some teachers teach all the science, and some teach all the social studies. So we kind of wanted to put all their all of those heads together and kind of pick up, you know, see what would work. Um, middle school continued to use additional department time. Um, we started going to collaborative meetings or continuing with collaborative meetings, I guess. You I guess I should say, um, do page ROE sessions, um, next generation science training with Northwestern. Um, and our intent was to have our District 58 teachers trained in hopes to write our own K-8 um, science curriculum. So we started um, with Mystery Science. I'm sure um, you've heard it's super fun, very NGSS. Um, like I guess just with the kids kind of doing the discovering and being excited about science and not that cookbook kind of feel um, our middle school units were written developed piloted and implemented um, over one to two one to two per year they worked on So up to that point in time, we had Mystery Science, which was a limited online resource available to the elementary level. And we had our middle school teachers who had really dug in and created some aligned curricula with a couple of units that were rolled out one or two per year. And that's where we were in the fall of 2017. And so then Julie Backwoods is going to come uh, talk to us about the last couple of years. Julie is a sixth grade teacher in Henry Park. Okay, so a little bit more recently, um, we did have the opportunity to kind of self-evaluate and kind of think about where we've gotten to and where we'd like to go. Um, we took a long time kind of realizing that we were unable to completely write an NGS curriculum, K-6, all the way doing um, justice to the kids that would be getting it and, you know, serving them properly. So we decided to consider alternatives to taking on that large, giant task. Um, we reviewed lots of publishers, over 15, online, and kind of narrowed it down to a few select. Um, we took time, I teach sixth grade, so I am banded with the middle school. Um, since they aren't grade level specific standards for middle school, it's just all banded together, saying six, seven, eight should accomplish this. We took time with the seven, eight teachers to kind of just dissect and see who would do what, using just what we're, our current curriculums are. So thinking about what we're doing now, how we can best align and keep forward, keep in mind, you know, sixth grade goes to Camp Edwards and what things can we take from those and still have that tradition continue on. Um, and then we decided to invite vendors as well to come show us a little bit of what they've got. Um, we did some professional development with teachers, kind of just getting that idea of how that instructional shift would change, not just here's what to do, but really giving that phenomenon to students and letting them explore the ideas and how do they want to learn about it and how do they want to. Um, you know, I'm piloting right now and I said, how would we test kinetic energy? And just threw it at them and, you know, they had some great ideas and always just kind of challenging their ideas um, and kind of guiding them towards what I actually wanted them to do, what I had the materials for them to do at the moment, um, but letting them feel that ownership of their learning. Um, so with that instructional shift, also the materials, we really can't do one without the other and just really providing that to our staff to get ready for that change. We had some vendor presentations and we selected some resources to pilot as I mentioned. Uh, K-5 selected TCI, which is a familiar curriculum. They are our social studies curriculum is TCI right now and HMH. And then 6H, 6 8 also chose HMH and iQuest. Um, so we're in the middle of that right now and just continuing to learn together through those pilots about the shift and understanding it a little bit better so hopefully we can be those leaders as we all move forward together. 
just a couple of images here of what the online components look like for each. This is a, a, a quick sample of TCI. There's obviously much more to all of these. The HMH <laughs> curricula, again, there's an online and a, and a print component to all of them uh, to some degree. And then iQuest as well has just some, again, they each has a, a what each site we've found to be well designed in some ways and, and as the process goes on I'm sure we'll find the ways that we wish each one was designed a little bit differently. Uh, the print materials and some of the uh, consumables that help uh, provide some of those explorations have been on display at the Downers Grove Public Library as well as at the Administrative Service Center since the beginning of January so that we've had, we will have had them on display um, for anyone to review in plenty of time prior to asking the board to consider an adoption. I've, we brought some a sampling of that display material here tonight over there in, on the table that's kind of in the dark. So if anyone would like to take a moment to, to look at those uh, at, a, at the break or at the end of the meeting, they're available to everyone. So as, as we've started to mention, we're in the process of piloting this year. So once the, the vendors were selected, we, we had to talk about who was going to pilot. And so all of our middle school science teachers have really been a part of this committee. So they're each piloting a unit in both resources. All of our K-6 committee members are piloting a unit in both resources. And in some cases, their teaching partners are joining with them. In other cases, their teaching partners really do currently teach exclusively social studies. And so we didn't make that a requirement, but we, we have a good number of teachers who have at each grade level and across all 11 elementary schools who have been involved in the process. We did add some kindergarten teachers to the pilot who were not part of the committee. Our kindergarten teacher on the committee is actually on leave this year. And so we wanted to make sure that we had full representation K-8 as we went through the process. The units were selected. Um, we talked about how the middle school topics were aligned by our committee previously. So we looked at what we had <coughs> planned to teach this year in grade six, seven, and eight, and selected units that matched that. Um, and then in K-5, we were able to look um, at Benchmark, which we know that a lot of the nonfiction topics in Benchmark are aligned to the NGSS topics by grade level. So where it made sense sequentially in terms of where, when teachers were going to be piloting, knowing the timeline we had, there are a lot of cases where they were able to select a science unit that aligns to the content that, that is concurrently being re read and studied in Benchmark. In order to make the final selection, we reviewed, at our most recent meetings, we reviewed several um, rubrics and criteria sets that were developed by different states and, and by different agencies. We want to make sure that we are incorporating student experience and feedback, some anecdotally, some formally collected. And so that rubric will be filled out thoroughly by everyone who's piloted uh, the materials over the course of this past first half of the year. And then we will be joining together as a committee on February 4th to review all of that information and reflect on the experiences of the resources. The financial component of this, we, we've talked for a while about the fact that our budgeting process will include the awareness that we have some curricular resources we need to continue to refresh. Um, what's nice about the, the initial um, look at these resources we've selected is they're comparable in cost. They're not identical, but what, what it allows us to um, not have to let that enter into the conversation. So the conversations around which resource we'd like to select are really going to be driven by the quality of the content and all of the criteria that the, that the teachers on the committee have determined as critical to the selection rather than worrying about whether there is a slight cost differential at this point. Um, we're looking into deferred payment plans just as we do with Benchmark only because that helps us to spread a significant cost cost out over a number of years at, at hopefully not a lot of additional cost to the district. All of that will be specifically reviewed when we get to the point of final quotes and things we would present to the board. Roughly, and I, 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 this number could go either direction a little bit, but it's, it's roughly $800,000 if we made the assumption that we were going to adopt resources K-8 based on the initial quotes we have from all of our vendors. The professional learning that's already in motion um, on Friday the 15th of February, which was supposed to happen in November, all of our K-6 teachers will receive a, a, an hour overview of NGSS, kind of an introduction to those instructional shifts. We did that a little bit three years ago, but it, it'll, it'll be a good refresher. We've actually had plenty of new teachers join us since then. And then on the March Institute Day, all of our teachers who will teach science are going to receive, the full day is going to be focused on science. About half of that will be on the new resources, potentially, that we are able to select, provided by vendors. And and the other half of that will be a continuation of district-led development on NGSS and what it really looks and feels like to teach in a truly NGSS-aligned way. This is the very beginning of professional development, but it's what we have on the, on the docket next. So where do we go from here? 
Our committee has that meeting on February 4th. And so one scenario is that at that meeting, the committee comes to consensus on materials to recommend for science um, resources going forward. And in that case, we would anticipate being able to bring a recommendation to the board at its regular February meeting. And the March training would continue and we would be looking again for purchase and adoption to be, to be implemented with the resources in fall of 19. In the event that that February 4th meeting doesn't lead us to a place where we're feeling completely comfortable with consensus, we've already scheduled a meeting for February 13th. It could be that that meeting is talking about next steps. It could be that that meeting is continuing to reflect and discuss if there's additional information we want to gather in between. And if that were the case, hopefully then on the 13th, we would reach consensus and be able to bring a recommendation at the February curriculum workshop and the timeline would continue <coughs> in that way. We always have to acknowledge scenario C, which is that there could come a moment where we aren't able to reach full <coughs> consensus on these particular materials, or maybe not these particular materials at every level. I don't anticipate that necessarily being where we land, but I think we, we, if we're going to honor the work of the committee, we just need to allow for that as a possibility. And if that were to happen, then the committee conversation would shift to a new path toward alignment, again, still targeting 19 as that fall of 2019 as that target date, and we would make some adjustments as we would need to. Um, again, the, the committee members have been working diligently and I'm, I'm, I'm expecting some really quality conversations on both at, at our February meeting or meetings as the case may be, but we, we put this forth as a possibility so we're all aware of what could transpire in the next few weeks. Some of the things I just want to leave us with this evening. The first is that this committee has done a, a tremendous amount of work. We're talking about years and years of really digging into what this means for students, what it means for teachers. They also have an understanding of the, the, the weight of their recommendation. The teachers on this committee want to be able to stand in front of their colleagues and their students and the community and, and, and be 100% behind what we are selecting as, as a district, um, and, and obviously we do too. Um, they really appreciate their responsibility to ensure three-dimensional learning begins to happen in all of our classrooms and continues to happen for years to come. The other key conversation that we've had, and, and as we talked about the, the, the many years of the STEM committee at our last couple of meetings in preparation for this presentation, this theme has, has recurred several times. We won't be NGSS aligned because we purchase a resource. That's really not true. We will be NGSS aligned when we have the, the successful combination of a, a, a resource that will allow teachers to teach in a three-dimensional way and the training and time and learning to be able to do that well. It's not about finding a perfect resource necessarily because we, we won't. There, there will always be something we can find that we wish were different about any resource. It's about making sure that we're implementing it in a way that supports teachers, that gives them time for not only initial learning, but ongoing learning, ongoing review and, and reflection. And that time for professional learning to successfully implement this, this curriculum and, and any coming forward will be a continuing theme as we continue to talk this year. The committee also recognizes there are two distinct res responsibilities that it is charged with. And, and one is, is the alignment. That's a mandate. That's not something we can shrug off and, and we, we understand the weight of that. The other piece of it is that it has to be able to be done well by our teachers. And so we have to provide a manageable and meaningful way to meet that mandate with quality instruction. Because we know we have outstanding, outstanding teachers. We need to provide them with outstanding support and outstanding resources to do the job that they are able to do. That is the end of our presentation. Uh, I'm happy to take questions from the board at this time, and obviously we're, we're, our goal tonight is to present all of this information in advance of a recommendation so that if there are questions from the board or from the community or from anyone, we would have a chance to answer and digest those in a number of formats prior to <coughs> the February meeting. Any questions? No? I'll just say that there's a, if there was ever a presentation that practiced what you preached, this is awesome. Yeah, it's a science standard. You're talking about obtaining information, evaluating it, testing it out, coming up with conclusions. I mean, this was this is a really well-designed approach. I'm just, uh, I think if we don't adopt anything, you should just use this presentation as our curriculum for uh, for teaching STEM topics because it it, it was really well done. So uh, kudos to you. Um, question uh, baked into all of that. Do you see your committee leaning in one way or the other? Things that we can anticipate 
a month from now? I absolutely can't answer that question very purposefully because we've tried to not have too many initial conversations simply because the pilot was timed differently for each grade level and even in some cases each building. Yeah. And so we had certain teachers working with HMH while certain teachers were working with TCI and vice versa. And so there certainly have been conversations. Um, and I think that you know each meeting we've had, we've heard different pros and different cons anecdotally. But I, I, I don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable giving any answer as to is there a strong sense one direction or the other. I am confident certain individuals have a strong sense in one direction or another. But as a committee, we haven't, we're not yet there. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's been uh, it's been a long time, so the board's excited to hear about it, and we also have to certainly acknowledge and thank all the teachers that are here uh, and those that aren't who have worked on it over the last six years. Uh, the board and the community certainly owe them a great deal of gratitude for all of their work. So thank you to all the teachers and everyone who worked on these committees. Next are communications. Listed on tonight's agenda are 11 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? Okay, if not, uh, next is the superintendent report with Dr. Krem Scully. Thank you. Uh, I have several things to report to the board and to our community as well. As is typical for this time of year, we have begun our planning process for the upcoming school year, looking closely at staffing and budget planning for the 1920 school year. We are in the process of considering and prioritizing some of the highest needs for the 1920 school year planning. Um, at this time, we've identified needs within our curriculum department. We heard some of them just now um, in relative to professional development, both with regard to personnel as well as time to allow for the kind of professional development that we know our teachers really do need a, on a consistent basis. Um, in addition, we've identified some needs for increased support in special education as well as for nursing and some psychologist uh, personnel as well. So we'll be reviewing those needs, have had some early conversations with our principals as well. Um, right now, based on our enrollment forecast, we do not anticipate the need for increased classroom teaching FTE, but we'll continue to monitor that as is typical as we um, enter the registration season um, for the upcoming school year. Um, also, we've begun to look at the 1920 school year calendar and at this point um, have drafted what we're calling a skeleton calendar. Um, you'll see it attached to the agenda this evening as board members. Um, it shows what might be the start and end days for the next school year term um, as well as some of the major breaks. As is typical for us, those dates um, again align as best we possibly can with those of District 99. We know that that's important for our community. District 99 does start about a week earlier than we do. Um, they made that shift a, a little while ago. Um, they are anticipating have air, having air conditioning. We uh, still will not next year, and so um, we'll continue with that slightly later start date. But those major breaks within the school calendar uh, will be the same. We do need to continue to gather some feedback and input from our teachers, our union leaders, our administrators as well. But we wanted to get the skeleton calendar in front of the board, um, really because we know we have much more work to do in this regard. Um, for next year's calendar, we're really looking at those professional development needs, and we plan to bring forward some additional options um, for the board's consideration, looking at either some late start days, early release days, some additional half days, um, to fold in that professional development that we know is so important for the ongoing work of our teachers. So we're going to be exploring those. Uh, we'll be bringing back a calendar for draft and discussion. Uh, by the board, we hope in February, and then we're looking. We'll be looking for adoption of that in March after getting additional feedback again from many stakeholders. Um, I, in addition, as I know the board is aware, but sometimes the the community, it's helpful to know that there's been some legislative changes for school calendars, and so we're continuing to monitor that. We're awaiting some additional legislative and procedural guidance from the ISB that will help us to really determine um, how those days need to be structured moving forward for next year's school calendar. So um, again, this is just a very early look at what might be the start and end dates and some of those major holidays for next year. But we do want the board to be aware that we'll be bringing forward a calendar in February for 
um, consideration and discussion with um, hopeful action in March. Um, in terms of our mid-year assessments, we have completed those. In fact, the, the um, assessments happened before winter break this year, so that was really nice. It gave us the opportunity to uh, make those data available to our teachers and our administrators over break and as they're coming back from break. Um, many of our teacher teams have already started. Um, some have even concluded their data team meetings. Um, so that's that's been really, really helpful. Our student individual results are also available online for parents to review. Um, and then we are planning for a review of the of the district-wide data in uh, February at the February 25th curriculum workshop. Also, <coughs> excuse me, also attached to this evening's agenda for the board is the FPC timeline. That is the updated calendar. The board will recall that in November we had a snow day that pushed some of our dates back. Um, that snow day was meant to be an opportunity for us to really meet with some of our faculty and staff and gather some early feedback on some of our facility planning ideas from the council. Um, with that date and a couple of <coughs> other um, adjustments in the calendar and working with our architect team um, and the FPC, we, we really took a close look at that calendar and have made some adjustments. So the proposed calendar um, as presented by the FPC is, is attached here for the board's consideration um, in brief. Uh, it will mean that the first update to the board will come in February instead of this month. Um, that report will summarize the findings from step one and two. We anticipate then the next report coming to the board in May, and then the final report of this year, hopefully encompassing the, the early stages of that master facility plan, will be presented to the board in June, so that the board, as well as the community, will have the opportunity to review that, respond to that, um, provide additional feedback, and really kind of um, digest that over the summer before coming back in August in looking at some of the financial aspects of that plan and what the options might uh, be around that. So we are on track for this new timeline and look forward to providing the board with an update in February. Uh, speaking of our Facility Planning Council, there are two community engagement sessions that have been scheduled by the FPC. Um, they are scheduled for January 23rd at Herrick at 7 o'clock and January 29th at O'Neill at 7 o'clock. And our hope is that parents and community members might come out to those events. You can attend either one. You might attend the middle school closest to your home. Um, but come on out to those events. We hope to be able to provide the community and parents with kind of an overview of some of the ideas that we are discussing as an FPC, um, some of the feedback that we've heard already from our teachers, and, and really getting some early feedback from our community as well. So those results then will be incorporated into the architect's report and the FPC's consideration for February. A couple of other just simple announcements. One is science fair coming up on February 2nd. Um, and the other is our Harlem Wizards fundraising event is scheduled for Sunday, February 24th. We hope to have some teachers participating in that event, maybe a couple of administrators as well, and that's always a really fun community event and a great fundraiser also for the Education Foundation. So we hope people will come out and support the event and also support the foundation. So um, with that, I'd entertain any questions the board might have. You gotta be able to guess what my question is. Sorry. Um, when it comes to the school calendar, you know, this is gonna be the tenth time I've said this. Um, so far, all the ideas I've heard is how we can take kids out of school. Uh, I'd like to see some more creative solutions in in working in professional development. Um, you know, first and foremost, we're here for the kids. Taking kids out of school that seems a little counterintuitive to what our mission is here. Uh, we have plenty of, we've heard many a times that uh, we don't have enough hours in the day to do everything we want to do with the kids, um, whether it's um, academics, whether it's art, whether it's music, um, PE, whatever that is. And uh, the only three kind of thoughts I heard right there were late start, early dismissal, or half days. Um, I do not want to get like other districts around here. Um, you know, I, I was surprised when I asked people at 99, when I, well, actually when I told them that um, they've reduced the school year for kids by six or seven days. No, we haven't. Yeah, you have. If you take all the half days, early, dis or I mean late starts, 
you've reduced the class time by seven full school days. I think that's unacceptable. And I don't want District 58 going down that same path. I mean, if we're saying it's not important to have kids in school, then let's try to come up with an online curriculum. But I don't think that's what we're trying to say. So let's see if we can find some um, better use of time in, in other things. You know, maybe there's other meetings we have that, you know, maybe staff doesn't find quite as productive. I don't know what those are, but um, as a parent, as a board member, uh, having my kids in class, spending time with their teachers is the most important thing. So that's my, my two cents. I, I, I will simply say I, I, I think all of those priorities are really important and I think our team is really looking at trying to balance those priorities. And so we will be, with whichever option we come forward with, we will be bringing forward um, some of the data that supports that. Um, and yes, weighing some of those priorities. It is important to have students in class with our teachers, but we also have to balance that with the needs for professional development and for supporting our teachers. And so um, we, we will be looking at, if, if we're looking at a late start or an early release, we'll also be looking at some of those other days that we have built into the calendar. So um, do we still need um, all of the days that teachers are released? Otherwise, do we need um, you know those, those other half days? Okay. And so we'll be balancing that. But John, your point is well taken, and I, I do think that we have to balance it, but we also do need to look at increased professional development time on a regular basis for our teachers if we're to accomplish what we've set forth in our strategic plan in terms of our curriculum initiatives, in terms of our instructional development and our support for professional growth of our teachers so that they can best serve our students within the classroom. I, I don't I don't disagree with any of that. I just Thanks. want to make sure that kids are in school when they're supposed to be in school. I mean I just look at the number of passionate pleas we had when we just moved the, the snow day. And, and that, was, that was the least disruptive thing uh, this board and the administration and staff thought we could do um, within the framework that we're kind of bound by here, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a contractual framework or whatever, and, and the community still didn't understand that. And that's just moving one day. Yeah, John, I really want to make sure that we're listening very intently to uh, the community about how uh, late starts, early dismissals, half days would impact them. Um, there are a number of families in the community, of, as we're all aware, that are, I have uh, two parents who are working. So if you need to get on the train um, and your kid is going to school, you're, you can't have your kindergarten sitting around at home waiting for school to start an hour later. Um, so I want to make sure we um, gather a lot of feedback. Because like, like you said, I was just thinking the same thing. We did hear a lot about just moving one day. And if this becomes a monthly thing, I mean, I think a lot of parents have the tolerance to um, put up with one day in, in February where their kids can be home and they didn't expect. But if it's now bi-weekly, monthly, that's going to be a hardship for a lot of families. And I think we have to remember, we were mentioning late start, is that on, um, this is an elementary district, not a high school district, mm -hmm. and I think that that is a different level of burden on both the student right. and the families when you're doing a late start. Mm -hmm. um, and early release as well. I mean, right. if you have a half day and you're coming home after lunch, or at lunchtime, there's no, who are you coming home to? Certainly. But I mean, that, that, that morning routine and stuff like that, I know, is, a, is, is much harder on, on, on elementary schools as opposed to, to middle schools or high schools. So I think it's going to be really important. I think I would have a real, you know, a real hard time supporting kind of a, um, a late start process because I, I think that I've heard from many people in the community about the burden that some of that would be and exactly how they have their day timed out and, mm -hmm. and how it works. And, and not that we're their, um, their daycare program, but having a consistency there, um, people build a routine around that. Mm -hmm. And I think we gotta remember the age students that we have in our district. Uh, even if a late start would align better with a 99, I think that that would be a hard thing for mm -hmm. me to, to support unless I heard otherwise from, from the community at large. And you and I know from firsthand experience about um, the precious commodity that Champions is over at Leicester. There are 500 students in the building, but there are only s spots for 28 kids. So like the, the idea that, there's, that we have you know, we, I, don't, I don't know how easy it would be to turn to other, other avenues to get these kids occupied um, and, and safe and healthy in meaningful ways from, from noon until 3, whether it be the park district or some other program that could be, be there to support families that are, are, have two working parents. 
So I, I just wanted to mention that, keep that in mind um, as we go forward. I know that, um, especially at the high school level, we see that late start a lot, and, and I think that you, some high schools have found success with that, but uh, I think that's a different level of burden with, with the age students that we have. I'm just going to add on one more thing, just as we're looking ahead, and, and we've talked a lot about the, the, the shift of that snow day. Uh, I know April 10th is on our calendar right now as a non-attendance day. I think that's because it maps to District 99, who also has a non-attendance day. I'm wondering if that or some of our other non-attendance days could be identified up front as places where we could capture those mm -hmm. snow days mm -hmm. during the school year versus extending it to the summer. I know we couldn't do it this year, because of, but, it, but if we were to plan ahead for next year, I, th I think that just would be a real benefit for our families. So naming those, some of those in intermediate days as emergency days or yes. possible days for the board to consider, absolutely. Um, one of the other things that I think we need to take a look at is what some of our neighboring districts have been able to accomplish with um, either late start or early release or half days um, in really finding out and learning from some of their successes if in fact that's, that's something that we want to um, explore. I, I cannot um, overstate the need that we have if we are to pursue the, the kind of rigorous curriculum implementation and professional development for our staff, we need to have some additional time to work with them. And so um, we'll be considering a variety of options and bringing, bringing forward what we believe to be the best option for discussion uh, by the board in February. And, and Carrie, I think what I'm hearing is we would need some more information on how that works for neighboring elementary districts okay. mm -hmm. and, and where and where that's beneficial and, and how those accommodations and, and workarounds are happening mm -hmm. um, in advance of that, if at all possible. But I think in order to help to get us to that point, that, that that's the sort of references I, I know I, I would I would be interested in seeing. I think the conversation has generally focused here on like an easily measurable idea of days in seats or hours in seats. I think we're a district where we're expecting more than time. And so when we talk about like what we expect of our, for our, our, our kids in our classrooms, the idea is around quality of instruction. And I think the idea of focusing on professional development is directly tied to increasing quality of instruction, even beyond the great work that happens in classrooms. So I. I want to be careful of trying to identify a place where we can carve out additional hours just for the sake of hours, not to say that we would do that, um, but I don't want to devalue, and I don't think anybody's saying it, but I just want to emphasize the point that professional development, uh, in my time in education on the private side and on the public side, uh, the amount of impact that happens from walking out of professional development sessions that's, that are well designed to taking that learning directly to the classroom uh, is just amazingly impactful for our kids and so uh, mm -hmm. I want uh, I will say that if we can find a ways to think about quality of instruction versus hours of instruction I think uh, that's where we move down as great uh, DG 58 forward in a meaningful way and lead the pack among the uh, among our neighboring districts yeah I mean I, I, I agree about just that immediate transfer of learning to the classroom I, I know that's why not a single one of us hesitated to yeah. to move that that attendance day to the summer because we, we knew it would be, we want we want that that learning to take place in February so our kids are impacted by that right away because we know we, we know how, how important it is and how much we value professional learning quite a bit. Okay. Any other questions so, or feedback? I I think the other one more uh, comment that I want to make because we talk, you, you made a statement about keeping our kids in the classroom with their teachers. And I think if we're making adjustments, I would like to, to know the impact maybe that this would have on how often we need substitutes in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Like, if this is making up for some time where we're pulling mm -hmm. uh, teachers out of the room with their students and we're bringing in, in substitutes, um, that has a different impact to me than, than just adding additional days. Mm -hmm. Because that is that is disruptive uh, to our students as well. So if if, if we have opportunities to maybe um, have more face time with their actual teacher as opposed to a substitute teacher, I think there's a lot of power in that. So um, if there is any of that, I, I want to make sure that we're highlighting that because that's pretty important. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So, I, I mean, I think that we're, we're hearing all the same thing, that we want it to be as, 
because a little disruption to the children and the kids and the, and the families. But I think we all recognize, and we've had these conversations as we're rolling out the curriculum, the board all, we all recognize the, the need and the benefit of uh, education. And we need, to, we need to have that training. So let's just have, have a little more conversation and more detail next month. Okay, thank you. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Moving on. Okay. Uh, next is the monthly business report uh, with Todd Drayfall. Good evening. So we're at halfway through the year. And from a budget standpoint, we're in good shape. Expenditures are below uh, the threshold. Um, there is one caveat to that piece, and that is uh, on a sense of cash flow, we are a bit concerned and, and watching where things are going to flow uh, in the next few months. Um, though our expenses are below budget, our revenues from the state are trailing which is kind of a normal thing, but we really have not seen a whole lot coming in. Um, we're, we're down a payment or two. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have about $2.2 million in funds that were available to use for cash last year at this time that, we, that are not available to us now. Uh, as you recall, there was $1.6 million moved uh, out of unrestricted into the uh, reserve fund for uh, insurance. Additionally, uh, we transferred, the board transferred last month uh, from working cash the remainder of the bond proceeds to the capital fund to cover the remainder of capital uh, projects. Um, that said, those funds were available to the district when things were very tight on a cash basis when it comes in in May. We're not in a position, we're not in a concern yet, but it's just as we're looking down the road um, we uh, have a concern that if the state doesn't somehow come up with uh, starting to push some money out, uh, we are going to be in a position um, that we're going to be very tight. Uh, we are normally tight right before the taxes come in, and so it's just something we're going to be watching, something we're, we're kind of monitoring. Um, overall, though, the budget's in good shape. Um, and you know, we're moving along on that. You do have, as part of that, uh, that cash piece, a transfer uh, from working cash to transportation uh, as a, a recommendation for this evening. That is a normal piece. It is a month earlier than it was last year, uh, in part because we have not had a, uh, a substantial amount of money come into the transportation, um, which we have several million. Uh, a fair amount, and I'm not going to give a number because I didn't look it up before it came, uh, of reimbursement coming to us in transportation uh, from the state. We just haven't had anything come in yet that's of substantive number. Um, so once that does come back in then we, and we have funds, then we will transfer that money back out of transportation, that loan back out of transportation into the working cash. Uh, more transfers will come down the road in the Ed Fund and so forth as, as those are needed. Um, that said, um, we did have an FAC meeting, and I think uh, Mr. Miller will, will recap that. We had a presentation by the auditor uh, to the committee, uh, had some conversations about uh, the audit, uh, the changes in the audit. You have a brief uh, presentation this evening on that uh, before you. Um, for that approval, uh, I used to um, used to make fun uh, fun of some friends of mine in the private sector because it would take them six months to do their audit, and we always did ours in three. Um, I don't get to do that anymore. Uh, the state did delay; had a report that was delayed, uh, and therefore that is why you're having the audit uh, two months uh, back, you know, past when we normally would have it. We usually would have it in November, and. Um, those reports were not finalized until after Thanksgiving. So, uh, and the auditor can go through that piece. Other than that, uh, if there are any other questions? Can I ask a question about contingency planning? You painted a scenario where we 
could run out of money, cash, I should say. Right. What is the contingency plan and the off chance and the very, very rare chance that that happens? Um, it, it, we get into March, and if we don't see any some significant swings, we would go into a position where we would start communicating, working with uh, entities, either bank or there are uh, some other districts in the area uh, that, as a practice, are able to uh, do some short-term borrowing uh, to other districts. It wouldn't be for, a, at this point, I wouldn't say it would be for a significant amount of money, um, maybe one to two million dollars. Uh, to make sure we can cover the, you know, those those are those payrolls right before uh, property taxes hit. DuPage County has always been uh, a tax a tax structure that you can set a clock and a watch by because it's so on time. Uh, we do have some changes in that tax cycle, um, and hopefully that will still be the case that it will be on time and, and you know be delivered and it will be good. But uh, I think by March we'll have a better sense of things. And again, we have an, you know a change in in state uh, governance today. Um, we'll see what happens as far as if the state is in a position to do something to uh, issue out some money. They they do have a backlog of about seven and a half billion dollars of bills. I don't know what they're going to do to find that money. Um, and we are a little lower on total pull, I think, at certain things, but particularly transportation and special ed money. Uh, those are reimbursements, and those usually get paid later. We still get our state aid just like normal clockwork like we always do. So, but yes, we're watching and, and maintaining, and we get in the position. We're, we're not there yet. We've got a few months, but I just wanted to start that conversation so if that comes, you're aware of it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Next is the policy committee met December 18th. Um, Greg or Jill report on that? Um, we met uh, early December 18th. Um, Red updated and edited the going on, the ongoing process. Um, looked at the internal board um, operations. We have six up for first reading. Um, we do have the one that we are uh, that we'd like approved uh, the abused and um, reporting abused and neglected child reporting um, that is being duplicated in um, another policy um, and one other thing um, the meeting tomorrow has been rescheduled um, and Melissa found uh, that one of the uh, policies that we looked at and approved in December, um, number 6135, uh, which is the accelerated placement policy, already had that number, which was the interruption of instructions for emergencies. So we're just going to be asking, nothing in the policy is going to change at all, just the number, um, and we'll change that to 6131. So it's an accelerated placement program that's going to be 6131. Correct. And then the inter, interpretation, Interrupt. interruption of instruction for emergencies is going to, be, is going to maintain the 6135 Correct. number that it's always had. Correct. But no wording in either policy will change, just the numbers. OK. Thank you. Um, so next is the first reading of internal board operations policy 8021, 8022, 8100, 8102, 8130, and 8140. Is there a motion to approve for first reading number 8021, code of conduct, 8022 meetings, 8100 membership and terms of office, 8102 vacancy on the school board, 8130 board member development, and 8140 membership in school board associations and place them on the February agenda for final approval. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carried to approve the first reading of policies 8021, 8022, 8100, 8102, 8130, and 8140 and place them on the February board agenda for final approval. Uh, next, 
is the first reading of policy for deletion number 8023 internal board operations abuse abused and neglected child reporting is there a motion to approve for first reading the deletion as duplicative of policy 8023 internal board operations abused and neglected child reporting and place it on the february board agenda for final approval so moved second any discussion all in favor aye, aye. opposed the motion carried to approve the first reading uh, the deletion of policy 8023 and place it on the february board agenda for final approval uh, the legislative committee did not meet in december and the financial advisory committee met uh, january 11th john miller will report yeah todd kind of hit on, on, on the big things here and the, the, the we spent the most time on the audit review so we'll get a repeat of that to the board here shortly uh, there was a little bit of discussion about um, uh, doing a little bit more of a comprehensive uh, annual financial report, uh, CAFR. Uh, many districts and government entities do it. The Village of Downers Grove is an example. Uh, I believe 99 and uh, some surrounding grade school districts do it also. It's just a more in-depth uh, analysis. Uh, we, we have, we can get all the financial information that we need and the regulatory information we have out of our current audit report, but it, it does put some more information in there um, not only related to finances, but uh, you know some statistical information. Uh, I think it was discussed that staff would have a little, well, not a little bit, but uh, quite a bit more work the first year. But then maintenance-wise, it would be, uh, you know, it would be a little easier the, the following years. But it, it, it's a way to increase transparency. Uh, it could, we don't know. It could affect bond rating. The more information you put out there, um, the better the bond ratings are. Although we have a pretty high bond rating, and according to our bond council that we talked to the last time we have as high as we're going to get in Illinois at that time I mean we can we can go up a notch but at that time that was the highest we could get so um, uh, we reviewed the financial uh, reports uh, talked about the fund transfer did have a little bit of a discussion in kind of a preliminary 2019-2020 uh, school fees um, so that will be coming to the board um, when, when was it? It's up for discussion Just, this evening. Yeah, but when will it be coming for approval? Pending the discussion this evening, tonight. we'll bring it back in February. For okay, approval. so February is when we kind of set those fees for the for the public. But tonight, and at the meeting, and tonight is just for discussion purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and then future meeting topics, uh, we, we just discussed a little bit if there's any future meeting topics that we'd want. I mean, there are things that the board would like us to discuss or get more information on. Always feel free to to contact Todd and myself. Or Darren, and I don't know if Darren or Todd have anything else to add. No. That, if nothing else, that concludes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the district leadership team did not meet in December. Uh, next, we will move on to our discussion, and Todd is up again. Well, I'll introduce Betsy from uh, Billy Cooper who's uh, your auditor, uh, independent auditor, um, that is retained by the board annually to go through and perform the uh, you know, the audit, and I'll let you talk to okay. that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, as you had mentioned, um, we did meet, actually, my colleague Susan Jones met with the committee. I was out of town uh, last week, so I know she met with, um, with the committee on Friday. Uh, I'm going to give it very brief. I know there was a lot of discussion on a lot of topics within it, so I'm just going to make it much more brief than um, what you guys discussed on Friday. Uh, but if you have any questions um, as I'm going along, uh, please feel free to ask me. Um, or if anything comes up afterwards, you know, please feel free to um, reach out to Todd, and he can certainly call me and, and get the information needed. Um, so like I said quickly, I'm just going to point out a few different sections in here. Um, on page one of the report is our independent auditor's report, probably the most important part of the, of the whole audit. Um, it was an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion, which is the highest level of assurance that we can give um, as auditors. I do want to point out on page two of it, there was an emphasis of a matter paragraph this year. Um, and that goes back to what Todd was talking about. It has to do with the restatement we had to do in regards to Gatsby statement number 75, which was putting the other post-employment benefits, which we call OPEB, um, liabilities onto the full accrual statements. Uh, just a 
brief, um, as Todd said, there was an issue with the report that the Auditor General and CMS, Essential Management System, put out there in October that we discovered. Um, they ended up pulling the report um, and didn't make the new report available till like November 28th from the auditors to you. So that put a lot of firms behind as we were just stacking up reports and drafts and had to go through and redo work papers and redo numbers within the reports. Um, but this, this paragraph isn't that. That's more of the restatement we had to do due to the implementation of this new standard. Um, on page 5 through 12 is a management discussion and analysis. Um, I always tell people they don't want to read the 100-page report. This is a great place to get an overview with the condensed statement, social and financial highlights um, within there, and then talks about some factors that would bear on the district's future. Uh, the next section starting on page 13, 13 through 21, is what we call the basic financial statements. Um, the first statements on page 13 and 14 um, are the government-wide statements. Usually one, if you work in the corporate industry, you'd be more apt to see this style of a statement where it includes all the long-term liabilities and all the long-term assets um, of the district. Something you will notice on here due to this implementation of GASB 75 and putting these OPEP liabilities, um, the beginning liabilities went up $39 million due to putting this THIS and your retiree health plan um, onto the books this year and it caused the district to go to have a net deficit this year rather than a, a positive net position um, due to the implementation of this. But realize too, and these, these numbers aren't numbers that they're going to come to you next year and say, oh my gosh, you have to pay these whole liabilities off. You're paying your contractual amounts in every year to TRS and to the THIS and that's what you will continue to pay until there's any until there's any change in the law. I know there's a lot of talk about you know how they're going to fund TRS and how they're going to fund THIS and so the change to your contractual obligations would only change with that. Um, starting on page 15 are the fund financial statements. So these are all the funds of the districts and much more similar to what you're used, used to seeing on a monthly basis. Uh, one thing I do want to point out here is the general fund, remember, includes both your educational and your working cash fund. And there are uh, combining statements back on page 96 and 97 that show each of those funds um, separately. Um, just one other thing to point out on here, the district's fund balance did go up about by about $200,000 from, from the previous year. Uh, then on pages 22 through 66, those are the notes to financial statements. That's where you'll find a lot of pages and a lot of information that just discusses the detail of the statements that we just looked at. Um, if you look at notes I and note J, that's where you're going to find all this the pension liability information and all the um, other post-employment benefit information. Um, I think we added about 10 pages or more to the footnotes this year with the, with the new GASB pronouncement. Um, there's also information on here of all the um, more detailed information about the debt of the district, um, all the capital assets, and any significant accounting policies um, of the district. Um, and starting on page 40, or 67, sorry, um, is our required supplementary information. It starts out with some multi-year schedules um, in regards to these pension liabilities. Um, they will be 10 years of schedules once the statements have been implemented for 10 years. Um, also included in this section, um, in the next section also, there's a budgetary statement for every fund of the district that shows the budget to actual amounts compared to the uh, prior year, fiscal year 17 amounts. And then lastly, um, on the last page of the report, there is a, uh, the, the computation of the operating cost and tuition charge uh, per pupil. That is a, um, a calculation that is done on the annual financial report that's submitted to Illinois State Board of Education. Um, so the numbers have been pulled from there. It's not a calculation that, you know, that we've made up as auditors. <laughs> so it comes right from the ISBE's annual financial, um, ISBE's annual financial report. Um, the other thing we did, we issue, we do have a required communication to the board letter and our management letter that we issued. Um, I'm not going to go through all those. If anyone has questions, I'm sure you've all reviewed them because they, uh, I know they spent a great deal of time on, on Friday um, going through those letters. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy uh, to answer them. Questions? Okay. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I thought you had something. Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> no. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> thank you again for having Miller Cooper you. as your auditors, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I want to just take a minute to talk with you guys about the school fees that were in the packet as well. Uh, historically, we would typically look at most of the fees going up by just our inflation. And so that is what we see for most of them. We'll see just a couple dollars inflation over uh, the majority of our fees. There are a handful of programs that we took a closer look at to really analyze what our costs are and then determined what the appropriate fees going forward would be for those. So for example, I'd like to draw your attention to outdoor education. This year we charged $160 per student for that. Um, when looking back at our actual cost, it is more like $180 per student, and so I'm recommending that we increase that fee to $180 and then with the inflation on top of that to, to get us back on track moving forward. Another program that will definitely be seeing a significant change for next year is our preschool programming. Um, there's several different reasons for that, one of which is that um, it is just a significantly higher cost than what we charge, so that's a piece of this. But it's also increasing by 27 school days next year. So we are currently serving those students four days a week and we'll be going to five days a week for next year. And so we see an increase of that fee to cover the increase of instruction time and again, along with the increase for inflation. Um, one thing that we did discuss for that so that it's more manageable for our families is to take it from being nine installments to 10 so it's easier to make those payments. Um, but there is a significant increase for that program. We also looked very closely at the cost for our OKI programming and determined that actually at this point we do not see a need to raise that fee. Um, currently we are taking in enough to continue to maintain that program at its current level. Um, do you have any questions? I would just introduce Katie Hannigan, <laughs> our business manager. We're really happy to have you here. Um, manager of business services, I'm sorry. So Katie, thank you for jumping right up and yeah. getting right into that presentation and discussion with the board. We appreciate it. Thank you. I just always say, you know, it's unfortunate we have to charge fees, but as Todd says, and anybody that's been in Illinois for more than a day knows that you know, we have to fund our education locally, and this is one of the ways that helps us do that. Um, I'd, I'd love to say public education is free, but that's never a true statement. Somebody pays the taxes somewhere. So this is just a way to try to help expand some of those programs and to, to pay for some of those other extras. Uh, many districts have done away with outdoor education, so mm -hmm. it's nice that we can still do that. And then a few years back, we started trying to just index that by CPI every mm -hmm. year just because we had a point there where we hadn't gone up for a while and then we had a big jump so this was just a way to just constantly just kind of add a, a couple dollars here or there so that we don't have any big jump in any one year so. mm -hmm. thank you okay thank you the next uh, discussion item is the superintendent search procedures um, as many of you know, Dr. Kermascoli is leaving us. She's going to take a superintendent job in Wilmette. Uh, so congratulations to her. Thank you. Um, I was fortunate enough to be on the board along with John when she was hired in 2012. She's been a fantastic leader for our district. Uh, a few highlights since she's joined. Uh, we did start the O'Keefe program, the all-day kindergarten. Uh, we have one-to-one -one devices now. We have a new math and ELA curriculum. Uh, we're piloting a new STEM program. Uh, we've had two significant school additions and multiple other capital projects, all while keeping the district within a pretty tight budget. Uh, most recently, she's helped negotiate a new contract for the teachers and led us through the, str the strategic plan. She's never wavered from a kids first approach while always being a strong advocate for teachers and staff. We've seen great improvements in our student outcomes and she's leaving us well positioned as we all continue to work together toward our new strategic goals. We have you for a few more months. <laughs> Thank you on behalf of the board and the community. 
thank you. Thank you. It has been my honor. So thank you. So uh, with that, we do have to search for a new superintendent, unfortunately. Uh, so the timeline for that, uh, Wednesday, hopefully if anybody uh, can make it or people will be able to make it who are interested. Uh, two days from now, we will interview a search firm. Uh, we have four search firms that we've lined up to interview. Uh, the next step from that will be we'll hire a search firm, which may happen that night, or it may have to happen the following week uh, if we don't come to a conclusion that night. Each firm, we already have the presentations from the firms. They'll have 15 or 20 minutes. We'll be able to ask them a few questions. And again, if we're not totally comfortable that night, we can set another special meeting to come back the following week to make a decision. Uh, those will be in open meetings. Uh, following that, the, that search firm will bring us candidates. Uh, we will interview the candidates and ideally hire one in March or early April. Um, I did speak to the RIASB, which is the Illinois Association of School Boards. I spoke to our rep today, uh, who handles Donors Grove, who we did the, um, the meeting with last month. Uh, he did tell me that our timeline is good. He said we should start now. Um, that this is the best time to hire a superintendent on the calendar year. Um, and he felt comfortable that we'd be able to get it done by the end of March based on his experience with other school districts. Um, district 58 is an aspirational district. Uh, we're a great community. We have amazing kids, parents, teachers, administration, and staff. Uh, some candidates have already reached out. Uh, to the district, uh, despite the fact that we have not posted, officially posted the opening yet. Uh, we're confident that we will interview several quality candidates. We will not be deliberate, or we will be deliberate. <laughs> we will be deliberate. We will not rush. Uh, if we don't get a candidate who's a great fit for our district, we will keep looking. This is why we are elected. The board has one employee, uh, and we will get it right. Uh, it will be a lot of work for the board over the next few months. We're committed to doing our duty and doing what's best for the district. Uh, and we also wanted, since this is the first time that the board is together since the resignation, uh, to make sure that everybody is comfortable with those, that timeline. You said the key there is that's you start it in the timeline. We will search until we find an acceptable candidate. If it doesn't, we don't find an acceptable candidate within that timeline, we'll modify the timeline. Um, but I, I think that was was key, is what you what you said there, Doug. Is that uh, we will find um, a highly qualified candidate that fits the needs of the district, uh, no matter how long that takes. But we need to start that that now. There's no sense waiting to start that process. And you alluded to the fact that we're sort of in that, that prime window where um, your most qualified candidates are going to come forward. So that getting on this immediately, because we have, uh, with the strategic plan that we have in place and the goals that we have kind of set out over the next four or five years, um, we need somebody that can come in and hit this ground running. I don't think we as a district, who you, you listed off some of the accomplishments here, but I think it would be very, very, um, have a very, very negative impact on the district if we put a pause on any of that kind of stuff. So making sure we get a, a skilled superintendent is going to be incredibly important for these next couple of months. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's the right approach. I think it's the right timeline. I just want to make sure that everyone that's sitting up here has thought through, and, I, and I'm sure we have, the fact that the reason why many boards stretch this out is because it has such a big impact on, and it is such a time-intensive process between the interviews and the vetting of the candidates and the site visits. And, and, and I cannot emphasize it enough just how important it is that we take the time to do it right. Um, and, and so I just want to make sure that we're all understanding that, that this is going to be a lot. But I mean, it's what we were elected for. And I'm not suggesting in any way that we back off of it, but just that we're, we're really recognizing and maybe going home and explaining to our families what this is going to involve as well. But I mean, the, 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 this is, it's going to be intense, but I, I think it's, it's, the, it's where we are. I mean, it's the, it's the important thing to do right for our district. 
think we have the benefit of option value right now, where we can be in the driver's seat and choose our uh, choose our adventure. Um, I think you said it really well, that if we don't find the best candidate for what we are tasked to do with the strategic plan, uh, we should, at that point, pause. Uh, but that is a choice that we right now would have. Uh, if we chose to pause right now, we would have thrown away that option value. And so I, I, I think that um, I was the only one up here that wasn't elected, but I was appointed to do this task. And so, uh, yeah, I'm on board. I, th I think, um, Doug, when we spoke earlier about this, the expression that you used to me um, was we're not going to try to put a square peg in a round hole. I mean, we're going to spend, we're going to be very careful, we're going to be very deliberate, we're going to um, try to, to meet our goal, but at the same time, we're not just going to be handed a number of candidates and then just pick the one that we like the best based on what's available. We are going to find the candidate who fits our needs based on our perceptions of our needs and, 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 and um, what, what the community indicated to, to us through this, the strategic plan. So um, I, I, like, um, I like the challenge that's ahead of us, but I like that the board is committed to um, just keep the search going until we find that, that candidate. This, and for the, every, every, the board members' benefit who weren't here, as John and I were the last time, this is, this is essentially the same timeline. There might, it might have stretched out a little longer because the board didn't have the uh, urgency to maybe schedule things. We might have taken three weeks to get a meeting together or two weeks to get a meeting together. Uh, but we're just going to, as a group, I'm going to have to be you know, more committed um, with our schedules. That's all. Yeah, it's 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 our schedules that that's that, right. mm -hmm. that 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 we have to adjust to make it go as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Because um, you know, last time we'd say, "Hey, nobody could make it this week," so we didn't do anything for for a week. That may not happen this time. We may just have to to get that lined up. So it's all yeah, it's a lot of work. So we all need to plan something <laughs> extra nice for our spouses and our loved ones <laughs> when uh, this is all over. Yeah, this is. The, You're this gonna is, have to bring some flowers. Home. Yeah. Yes. This will be as busy as you will ever be on the board. That's for sure. Okay. Next is the reception of visitors. Uh, oh, this, sorry. There's one more topic. Oh, nope. There's one more. Board self evaluation. Ah, sorry. Let's skip that. Board self-evaluation. So as we stated earlier, the board had a self-evaluation with our IASB rep, uh, the Illinois Association of School Board rep. Uh, part of that uh, led, us to, led us to come to the conclusion that we'd like to have another uh, reception with the board for the public, which we're going to try to do on a quarterly basis before board meetings. Um, we also went over some other board policies, and, and Darren may have a few comments on that. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, no, it was, a, it was a great meeting. Um, it, it's a really good opportunity, I think, for us to kind of reflect um, on some of the, the verbal commitments we've been making to each other, I think, over the, the last year. Um, and there was, there's a lot of changes we've been making to the way that we communicate with the public that I think are moving us steps in the right direction. And we took that opportunity um, to now go back and look at more thorough ways to implement it and prove that even more with the, those quarterly um, meet and greets kind of with the, the public before these regular meetings. But it also gave us the opportunity to, to reevaluate our board agreements and, um, and kind of update some of the language in there. Some of the language is a little bit outdated, so we clean that up a little bit. Um, but we also talked about really what our roles are as far as communicating with each other and communicating with the public and sort of the the promises that we're going to make um, when working with each other and working with the, the community at large. So hopefully everybody's had an opportunity to look at that so that we can put that on our uh, agenda next month to go ahead and, and, and vote on. And I think we also had a good opportunity to talk about the way that we onboard new board members. Uh, we're going to be onboarding uh, new members here in uh, a matter of a couple of months. So kind of having an opportunity to, to understand how we welcome new board members onto the board get them affiliated with the agreements that, that we've sort of made as a board and where they can find information so that they can get up and running rather quickly, I think was very important as well. It was a great meeting. 
Thank you for that summary. Would anybody else, anybody else have anything to add about the self-evaluation? I, I think the only other takeaway we had was the timing worked out where it worked out this year, but I think to, to push that meeting as, as close into the that summer time frame as we could next year, I think is beneficial when you have a new board come on board. The, the, the conversations are so valuable and the earlier you can have them, the better. And to really make sure that we're conscientious in reviewing those board agreements and, and reaffirming those board agreements on an annual or biannual basis. Bye. Agreed, I think it's one of the more, the most valuable meetings that we have as a group. So I'm just trying to remember, because it's been a few weeks since that meeting, um, we had a, we had that conversation about public comments, and uh, was the plan to punt that to the policy committee to take that up to bring something to the, to the board to revise our existing policies on our reception of visitors? I think that is. I think not necessarily to punt it to you, but to say <laughs> yeah. that the approach. Delegate. Oh. All right. Yeah, okay. Okay. Holy cow! So the light bulb exploded. Ooh. Oh, wow, look at the smoke. Yeah. He had a really good idea. <laughs> Holy. It's good that we caught that all on film for the village. <laughs> yeah, now we can prove to the village the hall, village hall really is falling apart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> give that to Dave. <laughs> Sorry. No, I don't think that. Please wear a helmet next week. Next month. Is there a nurse? Jeez. Yeah. 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 Not under any. <laughs> you can start going through those while I answer this question. <laughs> wow. Is that going to be on the video? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's going viral. How's your, how's your vision? <laughs> wow. So I've never seen that happen. <laughs> Right, so I should have said delegate instead of punt, but... Yeah, I, I, I think one of the things that we, we talked about so much in the self-valuation meeting was that idea that there's a difference between public comments and um, actual community engagement. Mm -hmm. And looking for more and outlining all the ways that we can engage with our community, but then also differentiating the two just in the right. language and how. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, I think the, the idea was we asked the policy committee to then go and take that and look at the language in our policies. Uh, in the board agreements, I think uh, it is pretty, it's pretty, it's always been really referred to as public comment in the more general phrase. Mm -hmm. And so that wasn't a change, that was just sort of left as, as it was. Okay. Okay, any other comments? Okay. On the self evaluation. All right. So now we will do the reception of visitors. Uh, this is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, subject to reasonable constraints, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised by <coughs> public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. In accordance with board policies 8022 and 1150, individuals appearing before the board are expected to follow these guidelines. Uh, one, any person addressing the board shall identify yourself, state your name, your school attendance area, and shall speak as briefly as possible. Uh, the board president has the authority to determine procedural matters during public participation, not otherwise in board policy, including time limitations when appropriate. As I mentioned earlier this evening, the board plans to allocate 30 minutes tonight for public comment. Please fill out the card if you wish to speak. I do have some cards now, but if you uh, have anyone else, you can fill out a card. Um, the board asks that each person who intends to speak plan to speak for no more than three minutes in order to allow opportunity for all to all who are present. We will invite those who have submitted a card to speak first. If time allows, others will be uh, 
uh, have the opportunity to address the board. The president is responsible for the orderly conduct of the meeting and shall rule on such matters as the time to be allowed for public discussion and the appropriateness of the remarks to the subject under consideration. At this time, we have received five cards. Uh, we will ask each person who submitted a card to come to the podium, state your name and your attendance area, and provide your public comment. Uh, Chris Hanley is first from Puffer. Good evening, Chris Hanley. My son attends Puffer School. Um, my comments or questions are regarding the superintendent search. Um, I have not seen any detail yet on potential community engagement as part of the process. I think that's something I've seen in other uh, districts have engaged in community either surveys or open sessions for communication about the, the search. Um, I haven't seen anything in that as, for, as well. Um, I also have some concerns with the timing of the search and the timelines that were presented uh, given the upcoming election that is going to be occurring in April um, and with the potential for four new board members uh, to be working with the superintendent moving forward. Um, if the timelines that were outlined are intact, um, we're looking at a March 11th potential board meeting for the approval of the new superintendent. That would give a timeline of two months and 19 days since the announcement. I've seen other districts go through a six to eight month process um, in terms of search. So I think compacting that search, while I understand that there is a talent pool that needs to be accessed, I think it's not necessarily comparable in other districts. Um, I think, you know, Member Miller, when the renewal contract um, topic came up uh, several years ago, you lamented that it was a long, arduous process, it was expensive, and it does take away from the board's and administration's mission to serve the, the, the community and serve the children. Um, but this is an important time in the district's future. There are a lot of critical issues. There's a perfect storm coming in terms of financial um, and facility issues that are going to be impactful to the, to the community. I'm um, just concerned with the timing um, and would ask that maybe a little bit more consideration be brought forth with the candidates that are coming in for the board, either their engagement. Um, you know, there are, we've seen situations in national politics, especially with the Supreme Court, on candidates that were brought forward um, in terms of timing and balancing those with elections, pluses or minus, whatever side of the aisle you're on. Um, I think that there was, there was fairness on either ar arguments, but um, compacting this search into what I potentially be an artificial timeline based upon the elections, I uh, have some concerns on it. So I would just ask that those be balanced as we go through the process. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. What, one thing that we can address would be the community engagement process. We'll find out uh, the search firms uh, all have a, have a different community engagement component in their proposals. Yeah. So Wednesday night, the public will hear more about that aspect of the search. Um, it hasn't been included yet, and in that because we'll be discussing it on Wednesday. They are posted online with the oh, they are. posting for the special meeting. Okay, so they are posted online. The proposals in there is some of the information on the community engagement. They will uh, obviously expand on that during their presentation on Monday. So there's Wednesday. potential for that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm sorry? I have a potential for it not occurring. Uh, well, well, we'll talk more about it on Wednesday when we decide on a search firm, but uh, I think the, the uh, anticipation would be that there would be community engagement. Uh, next, uh, Mark White uh, with the DGEA. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark White, as you know, Negotiations Chair for the DGEEA. I come before you this evening to discuss a common theme and to make an important request of this board. 
Over the past few years, you've heard over and over the theme of trust and transparency resonate with teachers, staff, parents, and community members. As much as the teachers want to move forward, try to mend the frayed bond of trust, there always seems to be an action a statement from the board or administration member that sets us back. Unfortunately, one action or one statement of one individual member can continue to dam damage our organization. This past week, we had a health and wellness and financial advisory committee meetings. We are working hard at the health and wellness committee to find solutions and cost saving measures that benefit the district. We've made several steps forward, but as you know, all of this requires trust. We've built trust this past summer and fall as we've agreed in our contract that the medical reserve fund would become locked down, in quotes, and no transfer would, would be made from it. That action has helped us be confident in moving forward. Unfortunately, the morning after our last health and wellness committee meeting, the financial, uh, financial advisory committee met. Board Representative John Miller made a knee-jerk statement apparently in that meeting uh, as questions were asked about the audit of the medical reserve fund. I like the record to state that this gentleman wasn't even in the meeting, so he's reading someone else's prepared statements. I was reported to me that at that meeting, Member Miller stated, we can just get rid of and abolish the medical reserve fund. Nobody understands it anyway. I hope you are all as disappointed as I am to hear that statement was made. Anyone who has been to past board meetings knows the attention and concerns the DGEA has raised about the medical reserve fund and the past actions by the board to divert monies out of the medical reserve fund into capital projects, operations, and maintenance. After the board transferred money back into the medical reserve fund this summer, the board and association agreed to add a contract provision 17.2D, which states funds deposited in the medical reserve fund will not be transferred out into other district funds. The association was hopeful and still is hopeful that that was a giant step in the positive direction of building trust. But as Mr. Miller shown the board's true intentions, can we still trust the security of our medical reserve fund? Is it a priority of this board and the administration? Where do we go from here? At the Financial Advisory Committee meeting, our DGEA rep was inquiring about our district and other districts having the medical reserve fund designated as restricted funds rather than assigned. Currently, there is very little financial accounting protection of the medical reserve fund, even though the contract says the fund cannot be transferred from. The DGEA is publicly requesting tonight the board stand behind their commitment in our, in our contract and modify how those monies are accounted for and match accounting policies and protections to 17.2 of our contract. We urge the board to ask the auditor to provide the action steps necessary in order to restrict those funds as soon as possible and ensure they are restricted on next year's audit. We ask at a future board meeting, the board invite the auditor to present the different ways to account for and protect the MRF from being rated for unrestricted purposes. This may include exploring, designating the monies in the MRF as restricted, establishing the MRF as a trust fund. This isn't anything new to the board. This past June, the board association, administration, and others were copied on an email. Is this Can, a public comment or is this a negotiation session? Because it sounds like we've uh, got some unfair labor negotiations going on right now. And if that's there's no true, negotiations in process. This is a sure sounds like, sir sure sounds like it to me. Excuse me, I'm speaking. Right. You're um, you, excuse me, Mr. Miller. I'm on. speaking. You've gone over Get ten time. minutes. However, I will, because of the the interruptions, I'll give you one more minute. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. Contained in that correspondence were letters from board's attorney and auditors, which suggested it may be appropriate to place those funds into restricted accounts. Attached to the statement are those such letters. What we're asking is that take place. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, certainly can be something for a future uh, board discussion. Um, it is uh, what I know right now and, and from that meeting is that the auditors uh, stated in that meeting that that cannot be done. Um, is that fair representation, Todd? Just, just, uh, just want to call a point to order here on public comment. We're not supposed to engage. We've done it twice now. I just want to be careful of like rules and procedures. Right. Just to state that. Yeah, regarding uh, what the auditor said um, and what I think um, 
a lot of the financial people in the FAC um, also reiterated uh, under an audit rules the t the structure that says restricted under audit uh, a governing board cannot restrict it is has to come from a higher authority in the sense it has to be stat for us it would have to be a statutory um, guideline so that um, what they what their pieces and we can follow up and, and go through it but what their statement was at the levels of of segregation and, and structuring that restricted can only come from statutory authority uh, above or regulatory authority from either the state board or from the general assembly you know in, in law to the district that's how I understood it uh, we can follow up there are you know we can and we can look through and document out what other what the different levels are from an audit standpoint um, and how those are listed and, and specified Okay. All right. Well, we'll be. We'll, we'll, I don't want to make it a back and forth. No. That's what it's supposed to be. But we will certainly follow up with and you. I, and, and I appreciate that. And the issue is trust. If, if legitimate questions are raised and the response is a threat to terminate our medical reserve fund, that is a huge issue of trust. We should be able to have conversations. Right. Pointing and and bring facts to the table, not threats. Uh, next, Craig Young. Hopefully glass free. Yeah, <laughs> not quite. It melted holes in my shirt, so oh my I have to get a new polo on it later. Um, all right, so I just wanted to take, uh, Craig Young, I'm the president of the Teachers Union, the DGEEA. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes at this meeting um, to talk about the search for a new superintendent. Uh, Doug and I had a really good conversation on Friday, uh, and I just wanted to bring some of those thoughts to the whole board, or I guess almost the whole board. Um, as you guys go into this, uh, you know, decision on, on Wednesday, um, regardless of you know where, where we stand on issues or, or different people's opinions, I think all of us can agree that the superintendent role has been a divisive issue for our district in the past few years. Um, I really see this search and, and hire of a new leader as a huge opportunity to put a whole lot of that divisiveness behind us uh, to get everybody, uh, the board, the parents, the staff, the community members, on board with uh, a, a new leader who's going to bring our district forward. Um, it's got to be that, that's got to be the priority, is that it's going to bring us together. Um, and we need to use that opportunity. Um, in the past couple of weeks, I've heard from teachers who remember Member Miller saying that, you know, it takes a year to do a good superintendent search. Um, whether it takes three months or, or it takes a year, we've We've got to do it right and find the leader that will be able to bring us together uh, and get the community ready to accept that leader as well. So we've got to find the leader, but we also have to have the community ready to really jump on board and accept that person as well. Um, so to that end, I want to just make three, well, I had three suggestions. You guys already agreed to one, so I only have two now. Um, first, make sure you're seeking input, uh, input from the teachers, input from the community. Um, our district is at a really pivotal point right now with curricular resources, uh, with strategic planning, and that's just two out of a whole list of things that are going on right now. Um, we need to respect the staff and the community by giving opportunities to provide input into this hire. Uh, we get it, it's your one hire, but um, at least, you know, value us, respect us by listening uh, and giving us that chance to provide input. Um, and I know there was some chances during the strategic planning process, but I really feel like that had a different lens, it had a different perspective, and we really need to be respectful of this, uh, give people an opportunity to give input on, on this specific issue. Um, so that was, that was my one. And then my other one is, um, I think it will be a lot of value if we can have one specific person that's affiliated with the district, not the search firm, uh, that can be present throughout all of the different opportunities that candidates have to speak to how they're going to be great in our district. Um, just to keep them honest, so to speak, um, so that they're really going to be telling us the same story, whether they're meeting with administrators or with parents or with uh, uh, the teachers. Um, and not only, you know, the, 
the benefits of that are really twofold. One, we find a great candidate, or, or don't, but you know, we, we really get to know the candidate better. But two, we also can really get community to buy in, because you've got this idea that someone was there throughout the whole process, kept them honest, made sure that they were telling all of us the truth, and now we can trust more what, what we've gotten from that interaction and that interview or focus group or whatever the strategic, the uh, search firms will come up with. Um, so just gathering input. Yeah, my other one was make sure there's always the option to not pick someone and, and just to say, you know what, none of these people are right for our district at this point. Our community, our teachers, uh, our parents are telling us that and we need to do the responsible thing and just hold off. Um, and you guys have already talked about that and agreed with that, so uh, I won't belittle that anymore. Um, and that's, that's it. I'm uh, looking forward to, hopefully I'll be able to make it to Wednesday. Uh, it's conference week this week. You guys know that? Tuesday and Thursday. So, uh, but I'm hopeful I'll be able to be there. So thank you for your Sorry. time. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, next, and the pen went out here. It looks like Melissa Rausch with Whittier. Sorry if is that right? Thank you. Nice to see you all again today. I'm sorry I wasn't able to make it in December, uh, but I did want to just come up and uh, say thank you again um, tonight. And it's a bit coincidental, but timely, that Indian uh, Trail spoke about Seesaw because today I'd like to also bring it up again as I did in um, November and just say thank you again for offering this to our teachers. Specifically, I wanted to highlight our special teachers. I can only speak uh, from Whittier. Uh, because that is where I am at, but our specials uh, teachers also go to other schools. Um, all of the specials in our buildings um, utilize Seesaw, and it's opened up wonderful opportunities for our students to provide formative assessment, communication with us uh, as parents, and enrichment opportunities for our students. Uh, specifically, Ms. Taylor Sopron in PE utilizes Seesaw to show us what's happening in PE which is amazing because I've never been able to see that opportunity um, and it's quite an interesting thing to see my children do sit-ups. Um, <laughs> Miss Stephanie Coates um, is our choral uh, teacher, our music teacher, um, and she provides us with the opportunity to see our children uh, produce music which the opportunity is given for parents to come in and see those presentations, but if you are a working parent, you have to take time off um, to see those opportunities. So it's opening up that opportunity um, for us to see the music program. Um, by far, Miss Rose Cloud is amazing. Um, she is the band director, I think is her, yeah, she does band. Um, she actually posts things online for the students to do and they're supposed to record themselves and then she gives direct feedback to them on Seesaw, which is just an amazing one-on-one -on -one opportunity um, and formative assessment and as a parent it allows me to really um, find value in the sounds that are coming out of the French horn. <laughs> 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 so thank you, Mrs. Cloud. Um, Seesaw was made for people like John Bolonio, who is an art teacher. Um, we cannot, I, I don't want any teacher in the district to like think that I'm coming up here saying that everybody, every teacher needs to do this. Um, but thank you for this opportunity for John Bolonio. He has embraced it and um, has taken it to a level of enrichment for his students. It is not just a communication tool for him. It is a tool to help expand the opportunity of art to his students. Um, many people have voiced the frustration in the district that we don't have art more often and John has truly embraced this opportunity and I applaud him. Um, in talking about Seesaw and in talking about professional development uh, for you know future years and whatnot, um, I know this is demanding on our on our teachers. It is a new thing to integrate into their classrooms, um, and I just hope that you consider uh, providing them forums and opportunities to come together to figure out how to utilize this resource to continue with those formative assessments, use that data, reach out to parents, um, and enrich our students' education. So thank you. Three hundred one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for those comments. Um, next is Donna from Bel Air, who I can't read your last name. I'm sorry. Sarah Lolly. Lolly. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Donna Lolly and I'm a resident of uh, Downers Grove since 1985 in the Bel Air area. 
Regarding the interviewing process for superintendent, my request is when interviewing a candidate, I ask the board to strongly consider a candidate that has had at least a few years of experience as a classroom teacher at the primary, elementary, or middle school level. Someone, if you will, has been in the trenches and has had that experience and has actually taught curriculum to the children at this level. I think it is very important to have, ha to have had hands-on experience as a classroom teacher, as a superintendent of an elementary middle school district. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and next is Katie Herkus. Hi, I want to speak um, more so as a member of DGEA than um, as a community member, um, Highland Attendance Area though. First, um, in terms of the conversation about the calendar, one, um, I respect many of you as friends and colleagues and community members, but I do want to say that um, I view myself as a professional and an educator, not as a babysitter. And so when we think about the schedule that's coming in the future for our professional development, um, I'm right with you. My husband and I both work, and I have two kids that will be in the elementary school at Highland. I will need to find somewhere for them to be. But um, as a member of many committees in this district, um, we can't neglect and continue on the path that we are on with our current calendar and schedule. Um, secondly, with this being a full week of conferences and this meeting this evening, um, I do have a sick kid at home, so I was able to look over some of the proposals um, that will be presented Wednesday. I don't think I can get to a 5.30 meeting this week on a Wednesday. So um, what I want to say is that um, as a member of strategic planning, I believe that was it, um, working with HYA, um, I was happy to see that Ken and um, Mary would be the two consultants that they are putting, that they would propose to put back on this job for the superintendent search. Um, I think in such a tight timeline, as we've heard some concern, they went through the strategic planning process. They're familiar with the district. They sat in more than any of us sat in any of those um, community listening sessions. And so I just think that it would be to our advantage to go with somebody that's familiar with the district, familiar with our leadership and our wants and needs um, in moving this process in such a tight timeline if that's what we're moving forward with. So um, thanks for listening and thank you for everything you do for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Um, so my name is Ami Johansson. Um, I've spoken to you earlier. My kids go to Pierce Downer to kindergarten. Um, I want to start by thanking Justin um, with the wonderful science presentation. I've spoken um, since the beginning of the semester how, or beginning of the academic year, about how I was worried about the science curriculum. And I've talked to Justin, and it's nice to see what we talked about coming to fruition. Um, but I also want to go um, with the person before me that science curriculum, the next generation of science standards are very different than what came before. And there is going to need to be development of teachers, professional development that they're going to need if they want to implement this. We are, you're talking about a very tight time frame of choosing one and then implementing it. So I do, I would, we both, my husband and I both work, we work long hours. Um, we use before and after school. So every time school's out is an issue for us. But I do think it's important to have teachers who really understand the material. And this is not the only material they've been asked to do in a fairly t tight time frame. So I just wanted to say that. And I also wanted to say that as we go looking for a new superintendent, um, I don't know who's going to be on the search committee. But I would encourage the board to have some outside people on the search committee, whether it be um, other administrators or um, I don't know if that's possible, other teachers, people who are in the trenches and who have, they will ask the questions that need to be asked. Um, and they have different perspectives, perspectives that are important. 
that I think need to be on search, especially if it's on this tight of a time frame, because we're probably only going to get one or two community engagement sessions. We're not going to get it very much if, if we're talking about two months. Um, that's, that's basically all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tracy Weiner with Puffer. Um, some of the things I had written down to, to talk about today are, um, it sounds like I heard back uh, during the discussion, but I wanted to um, reach out to you and tell you that I have been talking to a couple search firms, well, one, in the last week and asked a bunch of questions so that I could better understand the process of hiring a superintendent and what industry standards or best practices are, and here are a few key takeaways that I got. Most districts conduct focus groups and online surveys to create a profile of the candidate they are looking for for their next leader. They don't just take a cookie cutter, these are the things we need from the superintendent. They literally take the focus groups uh, feedback and create and design it from there. Um, one of the things that I talked about with this person also talks about when you're reviewing the firms on Wednesday is um, we don't want the people that are in their bullpen we want them to go after the people that we want, not who's available on the beach and bench right now. We want the person that is the perfect fit for us. They mentioned that this is a decision of the board, whether they want to be inclusive or exclusive, which I thought was interesting. They said the process takes 10 to 14 weeks from beginning to end, and that industry standards say that a new hire who was an assistant superintendent somewhere else usually gets a three-year contract and someone who is a superintendent somewhere else, so super to super, is a five-year contract. All that to say is this is very important to think about as the decision you're going to make will have a lasting three to five-year impact on our community. Goes without saying. Um, I did some research on all the current active searches in Illinois and they all took the time and incorporated either focus groups or surveys in the process, districts like Grays Lake, Butler, Elmhurst, Benjamin, Palos Heights, Lackport, Will County, Libertyville, and Township High School, Highland Park, and Wilmette. Congratulations. So I stand before you today is please don't check the box and hire whomever is the most fit for the requirements that you're looking for, but perhaps be brave and courageous with the search and maybe say, you know what, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to stick a pin in it and we're going to wait until the fall. So kind of like with what Justin had on the with sci science and STEM, there was a scenario A, B, and C. I kind of like that because it spelled out all the different options that are available. Um, so with the fact that this person is going to be tasked with moving multiple curriculums over consecutive years, a master facility plan, and a strategic plan that needs to get carried out, this is your chance to get buy-in from all the stakeholders and bring us together so that we all feel like we have buy-in. Don't choose someone just because you need to get it done by March. Choose someone because it's right, like a wedding dress or when you're dating and you're trying to find Mr. Right, you, you know when you know. The other thing I wanted to just quickly mention was um, with uh, something that Karat said, which stuck with me. I'm on the curriculum council, and there's a lot of stuff, and all the teachers that are on all these councils, there's a lot of stuff that's going to be happening in the next three years. You might already be aware of this. Uh, the days off and professional development days are absolutely going to be critical moving forward, or we're going to just be able to check a box. Yeah, we got new textbooks, but it ain't going to mean nothing if the teachers don't have time to actually learn what it is. And so I impress upon you his quote about quality time over quantity time. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Andy Schmidt, DGEA uh, Vice President. You know, one, one of the things I enjoy when watching uh, some of the, the, the political, uh, you know, whether it be the State of the Union or whatever, is the, the fact checking that goes on. Uh, afterwards. So what I'm providing tonight is just what I could find in a matter of five minutes. Uh, so please, between now and Wednesday, I would love to make sure that these timelines and 
estimates are, are spot on. First is the uh, Illinois Association of School Boards. Uh, I, I find it interesting that they, they articulated that this is the time uh, to be initiating a search because on their website it appears there are 18 searches they're doing for July 2019 start dates which would coincide with our, our need. Those 18, eight or nine of them are completely filled already, have been since either November, December. The other 50% of the searches are well underway, either interviewing or reviewing applications. None are in the infancy stages, none are being advertised, none are being posted. So I, I just find, find that, so maybe you can ask them about it when they come on, on Wednesday because it contradicts what was articulated to you. The other thing, going back in time, um, it's hard to find documents from you know six, seven, uh, eight years ago, but it appears that Dr. Paul Zander uh, announced his resignation at the September 12, 2011 school board meeting. The board then at their very next meeting, I believe it was October 11, 2011, it's a little iffy because Columbus Day is in there. So uh, at the next meeting in October, uh, interviewed search firms. That search then initiated October, first or second week. Uh, Dr. Kremskoli was approved as the next superintendent. I believe it was March 14th, 2012. That's a five month search from uh, interviewing uh, search firms to naming the superintendent. The outline timeline that was shared today, the two month timeline, is a 60% reduction. So to state that it's the same timeline as what happened when Dr. Kremiscoli um, was hired, I, again, I, I think it's a 60% decrease going from five to two months, but um, by all means, maybe that's something else you can look at for Wednesday's meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Three minutes. Nope. I guess we are at our 30 minutes, but uh, go ahead. Go. Yeah, you're right. I'm not. So Angie Kelly, Kingsley. Um, I just, I really urge you all to, you know, talk a lot about communications and how I know you all want to improve your communications. But you really need to do a better job of communicating why you want to have this done by March. Because it's a lot of suspicion going around in my mind. And as you can tell, a lot of people who come forward here Y'all need to do a better job of getting that communication out of why. Why do you need to have it done? And then you have a board, a new board's going to be coming in. I just, there's so many questions out there, so I just urge better communication. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll, we'll certainly hear more about that on Wednesday. Okay. Um, next is the approval of the minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the December 10th, 2018 meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the December 10th, 2018 meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? of the December 18, 2018 special, yes. we just, oh, December, we just approved the December 10th. So is there a motion to approve the minutes of the December 18, 2018 special meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the December 18th, 2018 special meeting as presented. Next is the approval of the consent agenda. Are there any items the board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet materials? So moved. Second. Any discussion? No discussion. No. You can't discuss. Can't discuss. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. 
Member Siegel. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet materials. Uh, next is a recommendation for action. Uh, the acceptance of the audit report. Is there a motion to accept the fiscal year 2017-18 audit report as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. The motion carried to accept the fiscal year 2017-18 audit report as presented. Next is the resolution authorizing transfer of monies from working cash fund to the transportation fund. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing the transfer of $2 million from the working cash fund to the transportation fund? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution authorizing the transfer of $2 million from the working cash fund to the transportation fund. Next is second reading of policies 4011, 4138, 8260, and 5139.1 as recommended by the policy committee. Is there a motion to adopt revisions to policies 4011, personnel, ethics, political activity, and gift ban? Number 4138, Personnel, Ethics, Conduct, and Conflict of Interest. Number 8260, Internal Board Operations, Uniform Grievance Procedure. And 5139.1, Students, Equal Education Opportunities. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. To adopt the revisions to policies 4011, Personnel, Ethics, Political Activity and Gift Ban, number 4138, Personnel, Ethics, Conduct and Conflict of Interest, number 8260, Internal Board Operations, Uniform Grievance Procedure, and number 5139.1, Students, Equal Educational Opportunities. Uh, finally, there's a second reading for deletion of pol policy number 4010 as recommended by the Policy Committee. Is there a motion to approve the deletion of policy 4010, personnel gift ban as duplicative? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried to approve the deletion of policy 4010, personnel gift ban as duplicative. A few announcements. Uh, as we discussed several times in the meeting, there's a special meeting on Wednesday the 16th at 5.30 p.m. at Longfellow uh, for the superintendent search. Uh, legislative committee meeting is January 23rd, 2000, or 2019 at 3.45 at the ASC. There's a Board of Education building tour and PTA meeting on January 24th at 5.30 p.m. at Highland. And a Board of Education regular meeting is February 11th uh, at 7 p.m. here at Village Hall. The Board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move into closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district, collective negotiating matters between the district and its employees or their representatives, or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees, and discussion of the minutes uh, lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or the semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by Section 206. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. Uh, the motion carried. The board will move into closed session in 10 minutes. Uh, it is now 9.28 p.m.